hats. Don't mind me, I got a lot of hats. Who knows who Phileas Fogg is? Give me a cheer. I can't see you. All right, all right. So if you don't know, Phileas Fogg was the main character in Around the World in 80 Days. And tonight I'm going to be speaking about the real life Phileas Fogg. And his name was George Francis Train, as in choo-choo. So... George Francis Train has been described as a crack-brained harlequin and semi-lunatic, and immensely smart, possessing immeasurable talents. All of this is true. Born in 1829, he was ahead of his time in many ways. A revolutionary, a feminist, a vegetarian, a globetrotter. He lived a full life, making loads of money at a relatively young age. After he made his money, he ran for president. And when that didn't work out, he ran for dictator. <laughs> he was jailed 15 times for his involvement in the Irish uprising and a revolution in France. Not to mention his support of the women's suffrage movement. He also traveled around the world four times, inspiring Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. And to top it all off, he's said to have invented perforated stamps, erasers attached to pencils, and canned salmon. This guy, he had a lot going on. <laughs> this fellow wore a lot of hats, so we're going to break it down hat by hat. Starting with his entrepreneur phase, and unfortunately, my collection does not involve a hustle hat yet. <laughs> So in lieu of that, I'll be wearing a top hat. It's tough to get these over the curls. All right. At 16, uh, yeah, hell yeah. At 16 years old, Train started working in the shipping industry. And I do mean shipping, very literally. His shipping was taking place on ships, and he was an ace at his job. After just a few years, the company asked to move him to England to help out their operations there. But before he leaves, he takes a two-week vacation to travel the United States, doing what I'm sure most of us did when we went on vacation in our early 20s. Meeting the president, <laughs> Zachary Taylor. He looks like a really fun chap to hang out with on your vacation, doesn't he? He managed this simply by strolling into the White House with a, a letter of introduction from a lawyer friend up north. He found the love of his life and immediately asked her to marry him. She did. And he invented the pencil as we know it today with a rubber eraser attached. All in two weeks. <laughs> this is how Train rolled. His ambitions were high. He knew what he wanted as soon as he saw it, and his ideas never stopped, not even on vacation. So off he heads for England, and it doesn't take long for him, for him to prove himself there. Before you know it, he's off again, this time for Melbourne, Australia, to start his own shipping firm, which quickly succeeds. And during his time abroad, he sends writings of his travels to the Boston Post, and they are so enchanted by his international tales that they fund his travels to Java, Singapore, Shanghai, sending him all over the Asia-Pacific region so they could compile his, book, uh, his stories into a series of books. Now, Train had arrived in Australia amidst the gold rush there, and he quickly implemented many ideas to help the country's rapid development, building a railway, introducing fireproof building materials, and earning such a strong reputation that he received an offer to become the Australian president <laughs> of a rebel group that was trying to overthrow the government. <laughs> so perhaps he was wise to avoid that, that little nomination and the political upheaval it would involve, but the seed was planted. The opportunity to become president never quite left his mind. Eventually, Train returned to the United States, having heard that the government was looking to build a railroad. They were offering money and land for every mile of track laid, and he established a partnership with Union Pacific, setting up a company called Credit Mobilier, which sounds very ooh-la-la, -la, but it was basically just a front company that allowed them to charge exorbitant rates, passing the profits along to him and his partners. Corpor corporations. <laughs> the scam was eventually exposed, but by that time, Train was long off the scene. Again, this is how he rolled. He was on the express route, gathering as many stops as he could and rarely staying long at any single spot. He had an air about him that people loved. He was a natural on the stage, wearing stylish outfits. Like this, 
bright white suit. And the more you look at it, the better it gets. I mean, look at that massive corsage. How does he not fall over? And a pink sash draped around his waist is so decadent. So he could never resist an opportunity to get on stage, and he frequently gave lectures on the many topics which he passionately supported. His speeches were pivotal for many Western cities, and some say that Omaha, Tacoma, and Denver all owe him a debt for helping to fuel their growth. So perhaps it's not surprising that eventually he decides to run for president of the United States. Hat change. <laughs> this one definitely doesn't do well with the curls. <laughs> it's just going to perch right there. Okay, so he runs as an independent in 1872. He doesn't win. <laughs> Shocker, spoiler. In fact, there were no votes recorded for him. <laughs> but there were speeches. Oh, there were speeches. There were so many speeches that he compiled them in a book modestly subtitled, The Most Remarkable Book of Speeches in the World. <laughs> Now, campaigning was getting a bit difficult by this point because some of his quirks were becoming more obvious. He took to calling himself Citizen Train, occasionally declaring that he was the only true citizen. He refused to shake hands with anyone due to his belief that touching another person's flesh would drain him of his psychic force. So when he met someone, so as to not to be rude, he would simply shake his own hands. Train had many strategies for maintaining well-being. He believed that extreme longevity could be achieved by eating no dead animals, so he became a vegetarian, and wearing no underwear, so he became a commando. <laughs> Indeed. Train's political platform included shifting from gold to paper money, the currency we now use. Oop. Get back on there. Eight-hour working days, which hopefully some of us now enjoy. <laughs> the temperance movement to shift away from alcohol, which I imagine many of us would not enjoy. And encouraging Irish Americans to invade Canada in the hopes that it would force Britain to grant Irish independence. Train loved Ireland. In fact, his vocal support for Irish independence landed him in jail many times, but once during his visit to Dublin. And rather than pay the fine for his release, he chose to stay in prison for nearly a year, using the time to write anti-British poems, which he sent to newspapers to be published. <laughs> you see, Train was not concerned with popular opinions. But even when he wasn't popular, he was popular. At one point, he was giving up to seven talks a day, and despite charging admission for his campaign rallies, he still drew people in record numbers. He was drawing crowds in such volume that Susan B. Anthony contacted him, asking if he'd be willing to speak in favor of the women's suffrage movement, and he readily agreed, immediately going on the circuit promoting the women's right to vote. He even funded their newspaper, which helped keep the women's suffrage movement alive during a very tight period. The paper also ended up getting him arrested. <laughs> this time for publishing obscene content. Although, what he'd actually printed was quotes from biblical scriptures. <laughs> and he had printed them to illustrate a point about how relative the definition of obscenity really is. Now, Susan B. Anthony credited Train's effort with a significant number of votes, but unfortunately not enough to secure their cause. Yet Train powered on, deciding that a trip around the world might help his political causes. And so returns Traveler Train. Yes. Yes. Guys, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Let the adventure begin. Okay. Now, Train had already been around the world once at this point. So on this trip, he wanted to set a record. He wanted to get it done in the shortest amount of time possible. But he gets a wee bit distracted when he arrives in France. I don't really know how to do this one. <laughs> Chapeau. Yes. So he gets a wee bit distracted when he arrives in France during one of their revolutions. And he cannot resist, in typical train fashion, he simply cannot resist getting on stage to speak out for the cause. And again, in typical train fashion, this lands him in jail. <laughs> 
this time a French jail, and he spends about a month there. When he's finally released, he finishes his journey, and he declares that he completed it in 80 days. You know, give or take a little stint in jail. But nobody actually checked the full duration, so that's what gets put on the record. Within two years, oops, I forgot my little Paris, ooh la la. So within two years, a book is published, and that book is around the world in 80 days, and Train starts telling people that he inspired the uh, novel's eccentric main character, Phileas Fogg. This is quite possible, given that he had actually been in France during the time that Verne would have been writing it, and he was making the headlines quite frequently with all of his speeches, but Verne never confirmed it one way or the other. Verne's novel was a hit, and it inspired the New York World newspaper to sponsor a journalist named Nellie Bly to make her own journey around the world, which she does, completing her trip in 72 days. Because she's a badass. Now, this greatly upsets Train, who embarks upon another journey just to best her, this time circling the globe with a new record in 67 days. And I guess he's on a roll because he decides to do it again in 60 days. <laughs> by, by the time he completes this final journey, he is in his late 60s, and he says he managed it through psychic telepathy, which helped him feel half his age. It must have been all those years not wearing underwear. <laughs> and Train's ambitions continued to soar. He was no longer seeking the presidency. This time, he ran for dictator of the United States. But as we all know, that position wasn't filled until 2016. <laughs> now... Train's speeches became increasingly disturbed in his later years. In one writer's description, <clears throat> he stamps on the floor till the dust obscures him. He beats his breast. He clenches his fist. He clutches his hair. He steams with perspiration. He foams at the mouth. He paces up and down like a lion in a cage, lashing his tail. In his later years, Train spent much of his time in the park, speaking only to animals and children. He died alone of a terminal illness in 1904. Throughout his life, George Francis Train walked a fine line between insanity and inspiration. He was many things, an entrepreneur, a politician, a traveler, a revolutionary, and toward the end, people questioned his version of reality. But reality depends on context and perspective. I mean, who knows? Years from now, people might look at Odslon and think we were crazy for knowing that Wolpertingers are real. <laughs> but Wolpertingers are real. <laughs> Evidence. <laughs> I think he's still there, right? <clears throat> Plus, there's plenty of them over at the merch table, and merch doesn't lie. So whatever reality existed for Train, he rode that train with conviction. He was immensely smart and a semi-lunatic. In fact, perhaps he was immensely smart because he was a semi-lunatic. So hats off to you, George. Thanks for keeping it real and letting us hop aboard the express train. <laughs>